Welcome to this lesson dedicated to a beautiful piece by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. And in this lesson, we are going to cover how to coordinate motions in order to make it comfortable and how to make it sound beautiful. I would suggest you to start working this piece in a moderate tempo, but supporting each finger properly and making sure that you don't accumulate tension in fingers that don't work. And of course, working on a smooth transition from hand to hand. <laughs> Here, when we have uh, black keys, for example, we can also shape that with motion out of the keyboard and then in the keyboard. So you move around a little bit. Of course, if you do that too much, you would rather distract yourself. So all these motions, they should be only functional in order to reach comfortable sensations, yeah, but not sloppy, not somehow broad. Hmm. Also, of course, when we switch positions, I was speaking about that in, in a lesson dedicated to scales efficiency, but when we switch positions after the thumb, we have to move around, move over while hitting the thumb, yeah? Not afterwards. This is too late, yeah? Boom, flip over other fingers instantly. Especially in this part, very important to control that you don't hold two notes at the same time. So just one note. In most of cases, people uh, lose concentration in such spots and uh, you might hear something like that when you hear that many notes kind of overlap. So your task is to reduce uh, such cases and just play one note at a time, uh, transferring the weight from one finger to another one. So you release the finger immediately when you hit the next key. Also here, you go in gradual motion toward the third finger. Here we have options. We can go like gradually in or what I find a little bit more efficient is to start playing the fifth finger out of the keyboard and then in the keyboard and then out again. So shorter fingers, one, five, out, longer fingers, two, four, in, out, in, out. So we have this kind of upper arch, uh, upper wrist motion, which works uh, for such wide arpeggiated chords um, always brilliantly. When we go oppositely, like downwards, I would rather use like a downward motion, like out, in, like that. And when we get to bar seven, there are two ways to play it. Either legato through, and I would suggest you to start with this way of playing, uh, when we would play everything legato, transferring the weight between hands, making sure that it sounds like one hand, actually. <clears throat> or, or separating uh, these notes, playing the first one with a little bit more support and the second one lighter and making gaps between them. So that's another way. And then... So you play that in a tempo in which you can transfer the weight properly and feel that flexibility and elasticity in the hands and a supported sensation evenness in uh, all the sounds. And then when we get to bar 13, this is an example of Baroque staccato, which uh, doesn't mean that the sound should be like somehow short. It has a certain length, but not extremely short. And also, here we have to shape this arpeggio in the same way. You see, using uh, wrist motions up and down, as have been explained before. Then, when you have such um, such uh, patterns here, you have to lean on the thumb properly, and then go up, down, up, down, up. And when you play the second thumb note, you release the hand, raising the forearm. Release the finger, 
raising the forearm down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Because you don't have much time between these uh, patterns, but you have to nevertheless be able to release the hand in between. For that, you need a support on the first note and then a lighter last note, releasing the hand and raising the forearm. Then we have pretty much the same tasks uh, regarding coordination of motions and only in bar 25 we have something new. Mm -hmm. In order to play that efficient, efficiently we have to decide on the finger and we have to decide where we change positions, like for example... You play 2, 3, 5 in the beginning of bar 25, but then starting from G you, you switch to uh, 2, 4. So 2, 3, 5, 2, 4. This might be very helpful and you can learn it also with a break. Release. Just to remember that, okay, that's my new hand position. And then gradually. But also we have to shape it with the hand. For example, going out of the keyboard in the beginning and then in the keyboard for the next uh, figure. And of course using some rotation when you return to G. Right, left. One uncomfortable spot here is between bars 28 and 29 when we have to switch positions from from here to here. So this spot has to be uh, has to be coordinated like specially. Most important here is to release the hand when you as soon as you have played the last note and you move right away toward the next hand position with a released hand. Relax, move. And then you focus the next uh, fingers for the next position, yeah? So avoiding haste and stress while moving to the next position. Yeah, so this is essential when you switch positions. And let's speak about expressiveness. So what is important here is to find a golden middle to make it expressive, uh, very emotional, but nevertheless not vul vulgar or not too much romanticized. Yeah? So definitely, for example, not more than that. These chords are important and we start to build our music in such a way that it would be clear how it is constructed because we have two shorter waves. Another wave, da, da, da. and then we have another longer wave. You see, so the bar number two will be more intensive, more explicit, and then again. Yeah. So this development is quite important here. In this part, in order to make it sound really elegant, we would have to avoid accents on the strong beat. So pop, pop, pop. So, uh, these notes before the strong beat, they are actually more uh, expressive than the strong beat itself. Uh, I would even call strong beats actually weak beats, yeah? because if we accent them, it immediately sounds horrible. But if we would... I love you too. I love you too. If we would phrase it, always using I love you too as an example, then we would reach a much more elaborated and rounded and smooth sensation from this music. Also here, pop, 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 pop. feeling uh, that uh, the expressiveness of this leap and avoiding accent on the strong beat. Mm. Yes, and here we start developing a very controlled end of the sound. In the left hand, it's not short, but it's a sharp ending of the sound. Like that. And you do crescendo all the way till the last note of the uh, of the bar. Take a gap and then and start much, much softer with delicate hands, like morbid hands. Mm. Mm. 
So that contrast is very important uh, here in order to contrapose things, like contrapose clearly two very different characters. And then also, since we repeat uh, this principal material in different keys, we can also plan uh, how we want to play them. For example, in the beginning, we start with, let's say, mezzo forte. And then in bar number uh, eight, nine, when we get to G minor, we can start mezzo piano, like a very uh, vibrant, alive and um, well articulated, but nevertheless more muffled color. And then when we get uh, to bar number 17, after all that dramatic uh, intermediary climax, we can start already forte. <laughs> And also, as you see, the character, uh, the new character starts from the bass note, not from A flat. A flat is the ending of the previous material. And then that's why you might actually take some time in the beginning of the of those phrases sometimes. And so on. And then we make crescendo. Then we have to make a choice, either make diminuendo. I really like that version because it creates this kind of dubious lost sensation. Or, or continue in developing a dramatic character. <laughs> then we would take a bit more time on the on D. And then all the way forward to till the end of this. And then contraposing again stuff. Then of course we can make crescendo through, which uh, would be a rather more romanticized approach. Yeah, so uh, gradually raising the volume. This is a rather a romantic tradition. Or if we want to like stay closer to a baroque style, we would need to contrapose things. Like for example, staying in a soft dynamics. And yeah, contraposing for the piano, playing with uh, light and shadow. So both options are uh, eligible here, depending on how well you can execute them. Both of them might work beautiful. And then, of course, uh, we have um, the last subject, let's say. And I would start it loudly because we have reached it after this climax. <laughs> But then that end, that up abrupt end that disappears, I would actually not slow down much, but make a really proper diminuendo into pianissimo. If you would slow down it, it would sound a little bit more um, cheesy, but also acceptable if you do it <laughs> till a certain degree, not exaggerating the diminuendo. Another like small cherry on top of your interpretation would be if you would be able to separate with the finger uh, the last note. Like that. You see there is a micro gap between these two notes. This is also a feature of Baroque style, such a finger articulation, and it's quite a frequent thing to do. Uh, in Baroque music when we have a line of 16 notes and then suddenly uh, an eighth note or a quarter note, a note of a different length. We would frequently separate that with fingers in order to make it, make it sound more stylish. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Uh, leave me a comment uh, with some feedback. Did you enjoy this lesson or not? And of course, uh, if you want to have another pieces covered on this channel, please um, write me some suggestions. I will definitely look at them. So have fun playing piano and see you next time.